The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. read a little something before I even begin because I believe that what God is doing right now is he's taking those things which are fresh as well as the things that are familiar and he's bringing them together and he's also beginning to uh, release uh, I believe the beginning stages of an awakening and it's going to start with it's starting with a sense of combining and understanding that the love of God is a holy love. You cannot separate the two. All right? I want to talk about holiness this morning. And uh, if you separate it, actually Sid said it last week, didn't he? Uh, Sid shared last week. uh, There's two ditches on either side of the truth. And it can either be cheap grace to where everything goes, or it can be legalism. You can fall in a ditch either, either side. And so when you talk on holiness, I want to know something. Just think about that. What a statement. God tells you and I, be holy for I am holy. Right there you shouldn't try. Not in the flesh. Be holy for I am holy. How are you going to do that? You better draw close to a holy God. We've so watered down Holy Spirit that we think in terms of spirit. But uh, Sid said something, might have offended some people. Uh, I'll probably offend worse. I'm 70 now. I have my birthday. So that means I'm going to say some of the things that I used to hold back on. <laughs> so do with it what you want. You don't have to receive it. But I'm going to start saying some of the things I said. He, was, he said, now maybe this offends somebody, but you know, a holy God, when you honor and respect and revere Him, and you have a real relationship with Him, you don't like things like, yay, God. Okay? Maybe people say that. Maybe younger people are accustomed to that. But you know what? That can be done flippantly and disrespectfully and with a familiarization that lacks the dignity that it deserves. Now, I'm not going to split the hairs on that because that's a matter of the heart, wouldn't it be? There's probably some people could say it and get away with that. I never liked zapped either because I was trained from the time I got saved that that Holy Spirit was a person. It was not an it. And you do things with an it that you don't do with a person. And with the person, you don't want to grieve, quench, or resist him in any way. And so I I used to have trouble with those words, but there's people say it. You you do what's in your own heart. But I'm telling you, there's certain things. I'll tell you another one, to tell you the truth. I think some people overuse God the Father as daddy. I think some use it appropriately, for He is our Abba Father. But I think some have gotten so careless with it, they're basically living in the world, living in sin, and they're calling, oh God, Daddy lets me do this, and Daddy lets me do that. I'm sorry, but I'm afraid you don't know Daddy that well. Told you, I'm going to say stuff I didn't say before. I was thinking this stuff. But I think it's time to get out there. You can learn that way. You can take it, or you can leave it. But you can learn something. Jesus called Him Abba, Father. And He says, I go to my Abba, and you're Abba. And there, there's, a, there's a, a, a loving affection in there. But to say it without the loving affection, without the relationship, it's kind of tacky. I want to I quote something from uh, <clears throat> one of Bill Hammond's books. He was doing it on, one of his books is on the history of the church. A lot of Bible schools use it as foundational uh, material. It's very important to see both the origination, the deterioration, and then the restoration of the church. Get the big picture so you know where stuff belongs and what's happening. All right. I always believed in total concept before you deal with the specifics because you don't know what to do with the specifics unless you can get a little bit picture of total concept. But listen to this. In a lot of his research, he basically studied all the moves of God. I got in trouble in the early years as a young pastor because I had friends in every camp. Do you believe that? I had Baptist friends. I had, I had 
good old Nazarene friends. I had faith camp friends. I was introducing the prophetic in 1979 and 80, and I got in trouble for that. I got in trouble for faith camp. I got in trouble for prophetic camp. I got in trouble for everybody that was my friend. <laughs> and it was the best years of my life. Because you know what? We can get to the place of cross-pollination to where we pull the gold. You can always spit out the bones. But there's people have a lot to offer. And if you can't cross-pollinate. But listen to this. I like this. This is a quote from one of his, in one of his books that I just fell in love with it. Because we're talking about the, a, a move of holiness that has now come upon this church for sure and upon our personal lives in a remarkable way after 40-some years in ministry, there was a clear uh, defining moment for me, uh, my son Jason, and other people in the fellowship. And it's a, clearly a mark of holiness, but there, it, it cannot be separated from the love of God. Now listen, um, <clears throat> the determining factor for participation in the coming awakening. Now this was written some time ago. Um, <clears throat> but this is uh, a quote from uh, Bishop Hammond. The ultimate criteria and determining factor to those who will participate in the next restorational move is whether the love character of Christ has become the inner motivating force. Present truth Christians should not base future participation on present day manifestations. The early church apostle Paul wrote the following words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, this is just merely the love chapter, but he interjected all of us in there. So no matter where you're from, whatever you've been weaned on in the church, whatever camp you came from, listen to this. If I speak with the tongues of men and angels, Pentecostals, Charismatics, and have not love, I'm a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. Okay, so Charismatics and Pentecostals, you can speak in tongues and be a noise, and that's all, without love, right? right? If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, prophetic apostolic people, and have not love, what? Hmm? You're just, a, you're just a noise too. So you have the gift of prophecy and you can fathom all the mysteries and the knowledge. It's not enough, is it? If I have faith that I can move mountains, okay, pr prosperity, faith people. If I had the faith to move mountains, but have not love, what's it matter? Do you see this? That's going to be the, the combining thing for moving forward in the things of God in the days ahead. It's got to be a love motive. And a love motive has to be something that you are clearly aware is the motive, not religion and not some kind of false grace to where, oh, daddy understands I'm a sinner, daddy, papa, you know. I've seen such flippancy and carelessness that he's a holy God and he needs and deserves the respect and the reverence balanced with the love of God. Love and holiness are one and the same. Now he says, okay, if I have faith that I can move mountains, faith people, prosperity people, but I have not love, I am nothing. If I give all of my possessions to the poor, historical Christians who rest their confidence in being conservative and the social gospel of caring for the poor and meeting practical needs, you know, it's very easy for them to poo-poo those spiritual Christians. I think we need them all, don't we? But even if you do all of that and you just spend your entire life giving to the poor and have not love, it's all dead works, isn't it? It's just a bunch of religion. Oh, how about this one? And surrender my body to the flames, holiness and evangelicals. Christians who devote themselves to the life of self-sacrifice, and there are many, avoiding worldly pleasures, risking their lives to spread the gospel, but have not love. I gain nothing. The departure from the love nature of God and the holy nature of God and that the two must co coincide is what's missing in the church, and that will be a precursor to the trumpet call. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy in your name? Did I not cast out devils? Have I not done many wonders in your name? And he'll say, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. 
You see, God's in the stage right here. And like I said, I'm 70 now, so I'm going to say a lot of stuff here today that needs to be said. <laughs> I've seen major sin restoration in my life of the most difficult kinds for 42 years. I was a baby Christian, and mental health was sending me people that they didn't know what to do with. They heard there was this Christian who's praying with people and getting results. And I'll tell you what, the only thing I did the, my entire Christian life is I pointed them to the Jesus in them, not to me. And that still holds true. To equip the saints to do the work of the ministry, you quit pointing to Joe Heavy speaker or the counselor or the pastor or the prophet or the apostle and start pointing them to Jesus. When he gave me the, uh, God gave me the vision of how to work in this temple and then plant the church, he showed me that fivefold ministers were on the bottom to serve the people. Kings and priests, I don't think we understand that term. We think of it in worldly terms. Priests are dedicated to others. It's not about them. Kings are not like in the world kings. Jesus says, in the world they dominate. Not so. I am among you as one who serves. You're on the bottom. Leadership needs to come from the bottom up. Now, I want to say something here without naming names over 42 years. You wouldn't know those names anyway. But there's a process of supernatural forgiveness to where there is a supernatural exchange that changes lives when it's done from the heart. All the matters of the heart are the heart of the matter. And a great majority of the church still forgives in their head and struggles with it for years. Forgiveness is instant. Restoration is the process. Now, I've seen, you need to understand three words. Forgiveness, which is instant. Restoration, which is a process. And reconciliation is something else. I've seen significant works of restoration. And I'm going to give you the plan. I never verbalized this plan. I never told anybody about this plan. But I might as well educate somebody because when I go be with Jesus, somebody needs to be helping other people, I think. But you want to, you want to hear the, the rough outline? You want to help people? Do you know people that were once saved and now they don't even go to church anymore? And they say they love God? That's deception. You can't love God and hate his body. Every time you leave the premise of the church or you want to isolate yourself from the church, you're in Satan's kingdom. Your father is not daddy. Your father is the devil because he's the one that wants to pull you from that. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves as some do. It was the oldest tactic from the early church till the present tense to get you out of fellowship where there's safety. Now, here's, here's the thing. All of you that want to help people, use this as a rough guideline. And by the way, this worked in my life. This worked in, this is test proven. I've got testimonies. I don't even keep them. Some of Jennifer says that Vicki or somebody was keeping from around the world to change lives. The best missions program we got are those books. People are getting hold of those books and they're getting changed lives. We get emails on that all the time. Best missions program that ever, actually it's better than supporting any missionary at this point. Because I'm seeing the quality of changed lives, and at least that's what we've been called to do. Not everybody's called to write. Not everybody. But I'll tell you what, that's what God's been doing with us. But here's the plan. I'm going to give it to you. I'm going to give you the problem first. The problem is found in John chapter 2. For God did not send His Son into the world. I believe this is chapter 3, 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, right? Well, where does condemnation come in then? It says, and this is the condemnation. Light has come into the world, but people chose darkness because their deeds were evil. If your, deeds, if your heart's not right, you will isolate yourself and choose the darkness. Hmm? You'll even say it's just me and God. The way you treat God is the way you treat people. The way you treat people is the way you treat God. The great commandment is to love God and love one another. You can't just pick one. Now, here's the plan. How many have friends that 
that you know they knew their Bible, they were saved, and they don't go to church anymore. Okay, they're bummed out about something, right? There's a high percentage. We've all known people like that. It's a high percentage. I'm going to give you the solution right here. Right here. I used Hosea 2, 14 and 15 for 42 years without telling anybody. It was a general, generic plan, and everybody's an individual case because not everybody cooperates, right? But here's what I saw of a period of 42 years from the time I was a baby Christian till now. The people who got restored, really restored healthy to where they had a testimony and they were stronger than they were before they fell. And I'm talking serious sins of every type. I've seen quality results. Step one, Hebrews chapter, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Hosea. Change Hebrews to Hosea. Hosea chapter two. Verses 14 and 15. This was the outline that I used in a generic kind of way. And it was the story of God's mercy on his people. Therefore, behold, I will allure her. I will bring her into the wilderness. I will speak comfort to her. And I will give her vineyards from there. And the valley of Achor shall be a door of hope. She shall sing again as in the days of her youth as in the day when she came up from the land of Egypt. I saw that God's pattern was what I was using as a baby Christian. I just saw that, first of all, I felt like I, Jesus didn't come for the hypocrites. As a matter of fact, hypocrites are the ones who are out of church right now blaming the church and pointing the finger at the church. Those are the ones that's going to be hard on. All right? But the sinners... There's cords of love reaching out to them all the time. He went to the tax collectors and to the prostitutes. And for whosoever will be willing to change, whoever would humble themselves, he would draw to them, didn't he? Who did he have a hard time with? The religious people. Uh-huh. And what was, what was, where did, who did he really confront? Did he confront hurting, wounded Christians? He confronted the hypocrites. Right? The hurting and the wounded... Those were the ones he was drawing to himself. And the first thing I saw was, well, he pulled them with cords of love. And I said, you know what? This is the story of Gomer and Hosea. And uh, did I say that right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> a flash of, of Gomer Pyle in my mind. I think. <laughs> Jeez. I know that's not God. But anyway, but anyway what God did to remove her from her lovers. He first, he drew her away. He allured her. He drew her with cords of love unto himself. And it wasn't for isolation. Listen to me. Don't give me that isolation stuff and tell me you are seeking God so you could go into church for a year because you were seeking God. <laughs> you know, no. The person who isolates themselves seeks what they want, not what God wants. That's Proverbs 18.1, 18, 1, 18, 1 or 2, I believe. I'm shooting from the hip here. That's, it's in the Bible. <laughs> All right. So look at step one. If I saw someone, they say, I don't know if I'm a boy or a girl. I don't know what it is. It is. I will work with them if they, want, if they want help. Because they're saying, I need something. And the first thing you do is with cords of love, you make themselves available. And you, and you draw them to a place to where they need privacy. They need privacy to work on the inside. And you know what it says in Hosea? That he, he, called, he called her into this place of privacy. He said, I'm going to bring her into the wilderness. The wilderness is not to isolate. The wilderness is, I'm going to get you to work on the inside. It's internal. I'm going to draw you into the wilderness of dealing with your issues. Now, 42 years, before there was even a name for it, here's what I've seen as a habit, as a continuum habit that got other people's attention to say, can, Dennis, can you help this person? In 60 to 90 days in the wilderness, we have the 60-day challenge on our website. Before we had the name 60-day challenge, that was the generic process for the person who really wanted to be restored. The one that didn't fight with the principles and the patterns that would be required. 
to face your, to face your pain and deal with it. It was, I'm going to draw you into the wilderness of experience. I'm going to keep your other lovers away from you for the meantime, but internally I'm going to work on you. And I've seen the most quality work in the most impossible situation, what people call impossible, most impossible situations in 60 to 90 days. And then I'm, I'm giving away my, my, I guess I'm saying all this because I learned all of this from my spiritual father as well, a lot of it. And he just passed away this last week. And I mean, uh, he showed me, Dennis, he says, they're not restoring in the church. What they do is they shoot their wounded. Or worse, the wounded run away and hide. And he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, I followed his example and I saw, I said, I'm already doing this, the next step. That after they work on their internal issues, root issues, in 60 to 90 days, of course, this depends on them. We've got the 60-day challenge. There's some people that took a whole year to do the 60-day challenge. So it does, it does have to do with how you apply yourself. You can make it long or you can make it short, right? You can't make it any shorter than God does it, but I'll tell you what, you can certainly make it longer by dragging your feet. Now, I'm going to bring you with cords of love. I'm going to bring you into the privacy of the wilderness where I deal with the inside issues, the root issues that caused you to be messed up in the first place. If you don't deal with the root issues, you're going to repeat stuff again and again and again. And he says, I'm going to comfort you. You know what that promise is? That if you will face the pain... I will take your pain and your sorrow and I will comfort you because I'm believing in you so much that someday, someday, you're going to comfort them with the same comfort that you were comforted by because that's the mission of the church. It's not just about your comfort. It's about finding resolution to your pain and finding it in God and then being, being so thrilled with what he gave you that you can't help but reciprocate and help other people. That's called a testimony. But you don't have a testimony until you've been there and done that. You've got to be on the other side of the cross, the resurrection side. He said, I will comfort her. I will heal her wounds. And then here's the tough part. He's healing the wounds. You deal with the inside. Here's the next stage. I never said this before, but this is what I watch for in restoring people. Then you give them something to do after the 60 or 90 days. Something to do for other people. Something to do for the body of Christ. I've seen people try to restore people and they'd sit them down for a year or two and do nothing. Like sitting by themselves helped. They could, they could get worse. Sitting there getting bitter, <laughs> right? But if they deal with the inside, the very next thing you need to do. We had a guy that uh, uh, fell into homosexuality, sin. It was a complicated mess. And my spiritual father put him in the choir. And you know, there's a lot of people going, no, no, why? Why are you doing that? Don't you know what he just did? He went through a 60-day, 90-day period of intense internal dealing with the root issues, repentance. He said, the one thing that this, this man did was that he would feel the presence of the Lord when he worshiped. So he says, you know what? You need to get into, into the group. He wasn't in leadership per se. He was in singing. Why? Why, why do you suppose that was so therapeutic? Because if you say you love God, but you can't handle the people, then you haven't seen the consequence there needs to be a consequence. And there needs to be some activity on your part to do something. I saw that work time and time again. That's the external battle. How about a woman who, Pastor, I had... Pastor, I've been in the church 10 years. I've had sex outside of marriage, and now I'm pregnant, and I've got this baby. Well, well, then maybe you've got a choice now. 
every time you look at that baby, you can see God's potential for that baby or you can see the consequence of your sin. You're going to run from that baby? That's the coward's way, isn't it? You're going to run from that child? Or are you going to say, that's the consequence of my sin, but God's got a plan for that baby's life, and by golly, I'm going to see that it comes to pass. I'm going to do something instead of run, hide, isolate myself, and lick my wounds the rest of my life. I'm telling you, I've seen everything that people called impossible change and transform in a period of 42 years, and it never deviated too much from this pattern, except the only variable is, is to the amount of effort that the person applies, because they can make it take a long time. But I'm telling you, I've seen the best finished work. Actually, uh, Jason and Gwen are a good example. You can look at their DVD of what was accomplished. 60-day challenge, but guess what? They did it in 60 days. And I ministered to them a lot of that, both of them. And they came out of it. And there's a testimony. And they want it to be out there so that they can help other people. 60 days, and then I gave them something to do. And in that doing of something, they got restored. Because you know what? They started thinking about somebody else besides themselves and poor me. And when you start doing that, you start growing up. And you start facing your pain. You know, there's, there's, the, there's, the, there's the pain. In, life. in this world, you have tribulation. Face your pain, and Jesus will overcome. Run from your pain, and you maintain it, and you keep it. Give her something to do. I always watch to see if they would do anything. But you know the most beautiful part is, and I've seen this again and again and again, 42 years I've seen this, and I'm going to continue to see it, and I'm hoping you're going to start helping people to see the same thing. Your valley of achor, which means your valley of trouble, your valley of trouble becomes your door of hope. Yes. That's the way God works, and hope doesn't disappoint. You'll be the better for it, and so will someone else. Most of what I've taught that has the most life to it, I blew it first. <laughs> Had to, get, to take it to the cross, get clean, and say, you don't want to do that again. Let's go do it this way. But I'm believing that. And I'm just, I, want to, I just want to give that as a prophetic word that the day is coming right now where I'm, I'm, there's a clarion call going out to people. You may be watching this. And sometimes some people take a half step back into fellowship. And even uh, Ustream people, I'm finding we've got some people connected on Ustream that are as connected as anybody in the building even more so. All right? So it's a, question, it's a question of relationship both with God and with people. Do you want your door of trouble? Think about it. What was, your, what was your door of trouble? It can be a door of hope if it's properly given over to God. All right. That was the introduction. I believe that what we're dealing with right now in the church is a spirit of holiness. It cannot be separated from the love of God. But I like the term spirit of holiness better than Holy Spirit because it's so been so watered down, right? Holy Spirit, and people don't even think of the holy part. They just think of the spirit part, all right? So the spirit of holiness, be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 19.2, speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel. While I'm speaking to the congregation, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, am holy. You know what that is even in the, in, the, in the original language? I, Jehovah, your Elohim, is holy. Jehovah means the revealing one. You know, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh. He's revealing. He's the revealer. He's revealing some aspect of his character, his nature. I, the revealing one. I, Jehovah, your Elohim. Elohim, that's your... God of power and might, that's your covenant-making God. That's the God who makes, who makes covenant with you. I, Jehovah, the revealing one. I, Jehovah, the revealing one. Your Elohim, your covenant-making God, your, your God of power and might, total power and total might. 
am holy. You be holy. I don't know where you're going to do that. Huh? Do you ever wonder? What do you do? Dismiss it? Ignore it? See, holiness in Leviticus 10.10 also says that you might distinguish. This is important because this is what God's called us to do in this church. That you might distinguish, recognize, differentiate. Actually, that's a good definition of discernment. That you might distinguish, differentiate, or recognize is to make a distinction is to discern. That's a spiritual function, not just a mental function. That you would distinguish, recognize, and differentiate between that which is holy and that which is unholy. Between that which is unclean and that which is clean. For decades, I've ministered to people in the sexual areas, and in getting them set free, they don't just get set free from shame and guilt. That's remorse conscience. That's after the fact. They need to be set free from the titillation of lust. The hook. The thing that you love and the reason that you keep doing it. You don't keep doing something you don't love at some point. That love is lust. That is not holy love. That's why it's better to even use the word holy and unholy, clean and unclean, because the average Christian is still confused between love and lust. You take the holiness out of it, you, oh, I'm in love, pastor, with so-and-so. Yeah, you got a soul tie. There was too much emotional contact prematurely. You can't hear from God clearly. You've been desensitized. Now, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 1 John 2, 15. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. There are people that want to say that they are Christians, but they are more a part of the world than they are the body of Christ. There's some deception in there. God alone is holy. The word is Kadesh. Kadesh. How do you say that, Jennifer? Kadosh. Kadesh, yeah. And holiness is not just one of the attributes of God, it's the very nature of God. And it carries with it two ideas. It carries with it the idea of separation from, which is good, separation from sin, but it's also a consecration to God. How consecrated are you to God? You can repent of your sin, but how consecrated are you to God and His body? Holiness is the absolute and final distinction between God and us as His creatures. To blur the difference is the root of all sin. The serpent promised Adam and Eve that they could be like God. Self-sovereignty, an independent self, is still the primary sin of mankind. Wanting to operate independently of God. We have that part? Now we get to the good part. Here's the thing that the Lord spoke to us. in, I don't know, was it last year, to prepare. That we were going to see that this season was coming upon us. This understanding of holiness. You know, it means separation from sin, but more importantly, separation to God. It means the kabod. How many of you heard that term? The kabod, the glory. I want to see that myself. I'm looking forward to that because we did some meetings in uh, Berkshires in Massachusetts and the weight came down and this was an unusual the weight of his presence came down the kabod and it came down to where the worshipers didn't want to worship and I said ah oh, I've seen that in the Bible but never saw it in the natural they didn't want to worship they set their instruments down and they wait unruly children that were running in the background, stopped dead in their tracks and sat down. That's God, <laughs> right? All of a sudden, the weight of God came and it did that. And we've seen that probably in our ministry and since Jennifer and I got married 20 years ago, uh, three times that I saw that manifest. I don't know what determines it other than it's unmistakable that it's, it's the weight of God and he's trying to teach us something or give us a foretaste of what is going to happen 
on a larger scale. Now, when God showed us that this kabod is also plenty of examples, the tabernacle in the wilderness where they couldn't stand, Moses couldn't enter, uh, uh, Isaiah in the presence of God, you know, uh, I am unclean. Isn't that interesting choice of words? I am unclean. I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of a people with unclean lips. We've got too many armchair experts that are going to have a hard time because you know what? If you really want to discern, and you cannot be criticizing people and walk in the holiness of God at the same time. Make up your mind. Do you want to be an armchair expert? <laughs> or do you want to walk in the presence of God and the holiness of God? When you're not, you become critical and analytical, and that's not discernment, that's judging. All right, here's what it is. Holiness is the product of grace. And you've heard this from us a lot of time. Holiness is the product of grace. I want to get to the good stuff, but I got to give you this foundation. We might have to do a series on this. Holiness is the product of grace. Grace, by definition, the one I prefer, grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do. Grace is the ability to obey because he's initiating. Grace, because right now there's sloppy grace messages and there's legalistic messages. And two ditches. But grace is the personal presence of Jesus, and he's holy. <laughs> so you're not going to escape that. Grace is the personal presence of Christ within, empowering us to be and to do all that he's called us to become and all that he's called us to do. For it is not I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? Now, grace is Christ living in me, but grace and humility are two sides of the same coin. Humility is the heart attitude that he is everything and I am nothing. I am a container and a vessel. I can do nothing. And others are the object of his love. That's healthy. That's healthy theology, but is it your experience? God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, so humility is going to be essential, isn't it? Yeah. Right? <laughs> Meekness and humility. It's the temper of spirit in which we accept the dealings of us as good, and therefore, without disputing or resisting, it is closely linked with the word humility, and it follows directly upon it. It is only the humble heart which is also meek, and which as such does not fight against God, and more or less struggle and contend with Him. It is a meekness before God and man. That means you die to your temper tantrums. I justified my temper tantrums when I was a young Christian. I jumped up and down and told God that when I was angry and having a temper tantrum, I was just showing him how bad that I felt. He didn't need all of that display. No more than a child needs that display to reveal what's in their heart. Right? So he said, look what's in your heart while you're having that temper tantrum. And not only that, but the law of sin and death is growing power in you to the, to the degree that you're in that temper tantrum. All right? Now, if humility is the substructure of transformation, it is the essence of all virtues then. Criticism of others never makes you holy. Say that back to me. Criticism of others never makes you holy. The means to holiness is grace. Grace, this, oh, by the way, this is Jonathan Edwards. Grace is the glory begun, and glory is the grace perfected. Isn't that pretty? Mm. The means to holiness is grace. Grace is the glory begun, and glory, okay. Now you want to hear the mandate God gave Jennifer and I? And I hope he gives it to you too. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 10, 13 to 25, somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. It's the Zadok priesthood. 
And God was saying for where we're at, and we've always felt that we're forerunners. We've been called forerunners even by uh, spiritual people over us. They always said uh, when Dennis and uh, Jennifer get tired of doing something, that's because everybody else is doing it by that time. And <laughs> we want to move on to the next thing. All right. And what I believe he's doing now is a no-nonsense, no-baby food anymore. That holiness must be presented to the church properly. There are more heresies out there right now than just about any other time in Christianity. And if you want to get really confused, get your theology from Facebook. <laughs> As one, one comedian once said, well, you know it's got to be true. It was on Facebook. <laughs> All right. Here it is, Ezekiel 44. And the Levites who went far from me when Israel went astray, who strayed away from me after their idols, they shall bear the iniquity. They shall not come near to me to minister to me as a priest, nor shall they come near to any of my holy things, nor into the most holy place. But they shall bear their shame and their abomination which they have committed. Nevertheless, it's always a nevertheless. It's redemption the name of the game? Yeah. But here's, here's what he said. But the priest, the Levites, the son of Zadok, who kept my charge of my sanctuary, when the children of Israel went astray from me, they shall come near to me. I believe there's an obligation that there are those that are going to come near to God for the benefit of those who have gone astray. They're going to come near to God for what purpose? It says, they shall come near to me. All right? They shall come near to me to minister to me. They're going to be drawing close to me. Secondly, they will stand before me to offer the fat and the blood. Minister to God. Well, let's back up. Let's go to minister to God. Lifting hands, we talked about that when we started. Is people more comfortable in a football game lifting their hands and carrying on than in church? Lifting hands says, I need you. Can you do that right now? Can you, can you with a clear conscience, lift up your hands and say, Jesus, I need you. You should. There shouldn't be a problem with it. I need you. Secondly, keep your hands up. The blood might, some of you might, your blood pressure might <laughs> struggle. I surrender. Do you really surrender to God or do you want what you want? I surrender. The third thing, I pledge allegiance to the King of Kings. That's what I'm saying when I lift my hands up. I pledge allegiance to you. I'm pledging allegiance. Your arm's getting tired? I'm almost done. I exalt and honor you. I'm exalting and honoring you with my life. I'm offering you. I need you. I surrender. I pledge allegiance to you. I exalt and honor you, and I worship you. I liked it in the faith book in Hebrews where it says, I want to worship like Abel, walk like Enoch, and work like Noah. Then you really got your act together, right? <laughs> I'm going to worship like Abel. I'm going to walk like Enoch, and I'm going to work like Noah. Wow. That's the way to do it, by the grace of God, right? Now, here's some of the things that he told them, sons of Zadok. I want you to minister to God. I want you to really do just what we did, knowing that ministering to him is first and foremost. Secondly, offer the, flat, uh, the fat and the blood. The blood representing for sin, right? This is kind of self-explanatory. But the, the fat you're offering is for the glory of the kingdom to come. I offer the blood for the sin, but the fat for the glory of the kingdom to come, right? I want to get and offer my sacrifice for what is yet to come. He also said to wear linen. Don't wear anything that makes you sweat. The church... To be a priest is going to have to learn how to operate without striving. That the peace of God rules, then Jesus is ruling. When peace isn't ruling, he's not. You're still saved, but he isn't ruling. King self got in there. The peace of God should be a walk. And in your 
walk with God just like you got saved. What, what happened when you got saved? You got peace with God. And you've got the peace of God you reconcile to Him. Now you need the peace of God to guard your heart and your mind as a constant. And the God of peace can crush the enemy beneath your feet. Peace with God, peace of God, God of peace. Distinctive differences in the rule of God, but it functions that way and the evil one can't touch you while the fruit of the Spirit is ruling. Now, no sweat. I want your ministry not to be one where you perspire and strive and try. I want you to trust and yield and surrender just what you said you were doing ministering to me. In other words, I want you to walk out what you said you did with your hands. Your allegiance. Let the peace of God rule in day-to-day -day activities. Now, here's the part that he's telling us to do. We're going to have to do a series on this because I'm going too slow. Right, Jennifer? Just nod your head. Jennifer. Going too slow. <laughs> This is too good, though. This is exactly what God, and I know that I've heard from God, and I know that this is what he wants, and it's been over a period of time. It's all, you're only going to hear it more anyway, one way or another. But he says, teach God's people the difference between the holy and the unholy. If ever there was a time in the church where there's confusion between that which is holy and that which is unholy, it's now. They've got love so distorted that it has no holiness in it. It's all mixed in with lust. Well, I should be able to live with them. I love them. You know, forget sin and what the Bible calls sin. Just throw the word love in there and everything will work out. That's where that has to be addressed. But God's going to raise up the priesthood. He's going to raise up the believers to operate as priests who are going to minister to people and they're going to teach people the difference between the holy and the unholy. Matter of fact, we're talking about doing a, a sexual issues module, uh, and kind of a group thing. It's still in the working phase somewhere around January. Teach people how to get out of it. Teach people, for, what we found out is we started to teach people how to get out of it and found out first you've got to teach them that it's wrong. Isn't that something? That there's actually people have to first find out that it's wrong? Then they can get out of it. But it's Teach God's people the difference between the holy and the unholy. Cause God's people to discern between clean and unclean. For decades when I've been ministering to people that where I saw the most effective deliverance take place in people's lives is when I didn't use the word love or lust. I would ask them to discern in their own spirit clean or unclean. And you'd be surprised how they do. I remember the one instance we had a, a, a wife that approached us and said, I think my husband's got a work wife. You know what a work wife is? Somebody where you got a soul tie, spiritual adultery is what it is. With someone at work. And he goes, oh, no. But, you know, most of the time men are a little clueless and the women do pick up on stuff. But anyway, it can work the other way too. But she's going, I'm not at work, but I'm telling you, it don't feel right in my gut. She was discerning, not reasoning, not judging. She was discerning there's some kind of a distance between me and my husband. And she said, I think it's that woman at work. And he goes, no, but he was so innocent. He'd come over to Jennifer and I, and I said, you want to find out? Do you want to know? We're going to go to the Lord, the Lord in you. Close your eyes. Picture that woman at work. How did it feel? Whoa. He felt the titillation. That's the soul tie. That's the lust connection. There's a seducing spirit that got you hooked in there, and you're just calling it a relationship, a friend. No, no. A friend doesn't have titillation. You know, they, they run counselors and pastors and doctors and lawyers through that same test, you know. They'll sit there and say, look at your appointment book. Uh, I've got Mary, Alice, John, Kevin, Sally. Why the reaction on Sally? Why the excitement? There's, some, there's a connection there that's not healthy called transference. But there's, a, there's, a, there's an unhealthy connection there. And you know what they'll do? They'll call it love. Do you think we need people to teach clean from the unclean, the holy from the unholy? 
And I'm telling you, I've seen the pattern again and again. 60-day challenge, which was named after Jennifer, who had all her counseling degrees, certified counselor, secular, as well as Christian. And in 60 days, she was so changed, her mentor said, what happened to you? Her mentor said she was too emotionally damaged. This was a counselor. You're too emotionally damaged to ever be used by the Lord. You're too far gone. I said, that's funny. I see a world-class teacher. And I see somebody that, well, yeah, I called her a little much afraid. But I said, we can deal with that. And in 60 days, she was as fearless as a lion, dealing with little clusters of fears. And what she learned, and she just threw all of her training on the shelf, is she said, God searched is better than man searched. And she just said, the root issues would have never been found with a case history in her particular case. She said, I would rather just let God knit me together in my mother's womb, let him search me. What happened to you, Jennifer? So we named the 60-day challenge after her. Now, 60 days, I saw radical internal change in 60 days, but she guess what? She applied herself. Hers was actually a little faster. But I'm saying in restoration, 60 to 90 days, you could deal with an internal pile of garbage if you really meant business. Then the second test will be, will you do something? You know, when God restored me, it took a year. The first thing he did was he did the internal stuff. And that probably lasted two or three months of really heavy-duty internal stuff. Practice what you preach. Then the Lord spoke to me and he says, you know what your ministry is? He gave me something to do. Your, your ministry for the next 30 days? No, what did he say? Six months. The next six months, your ministry is that little girl, Jennifer's daughter who was raised without a father. And I went to school with her and I sat in the cafeteria and met her Christian friends. God gave me something to do to get off of me. That's part of your restoration. Then a total stranger came up to me and it was very interesting. A prophetic word from a teacher who didn't know me said, I don't know who you are and if you're even interested, but God told me for the next six months. That got my attention. Because what did God just say? For the next six months, that's your ministry, that little girl. Not that we were ever done. <laughs> that little girl turned around, didn't she? Because she would tell me stuff and deal with me, and she wouldn't deal with her mother. And if she's watching, you know it's true. <laughs> the next six months, a man walked up to me and said, I'm giving you a prophetic word. For the next six months, prepare materials for preaching and teaching. I don't even know if you care about preaching or teaching. But he said, for the next six months, that got my attention. I never promoted myself. We did traveling ministry for 12 years, right? Never asked to speak anywhere, ever. And at the 12-year mark from the Sunday that I resigned, one year to the day that I resigned my ministry in Pennsylvania, one year to the day we got a call to do a church, call out of the blue. After that church was on the Sunday one year. So God's true to his word. He knows what he's doing. You see, forgiveness is instant. Restoration takes time. But the internal battle can be won in two or three months. The question is, what do you do after that toward other people? That will determine your restoration. And you can do it quickly, or you can take as long as you want by not dealing with internal issues. Would you be willing to help someone like that? Give them the 60-day challenge if you don't know how to do it. Then go online. It'd be the smartest thing they've ever done. As a matter of fact, anybody in my church that hasn't done the 60-day challenge, you don't know what you're missing. And you don't understand the efficacy of it. But we're getting emails from around the world, literally around the world. This is not bragging. This is just fact. The best missions program is our books right now is because for some reason people are catching it even from the books. But the online school is even better. 
It's got more information. It's got more explanation. It's got more demonstration. But I'll tell you what, God wants to raise up sons of Zadok who are basically going to teach my people the difference between that which is holy and that which is not holy. To teach them that which is clean and that which is not clean. And he's going to say, I'm going to have them stand as judges. You know what he means by judges? When you judge, you judge righteous judgment. That's basically, I only do what I see my father doing. I only say what I hear my father. You're coming from the place of discernment. Discernment comes out of abounding love. You've got to have the heart of the Father before you're going to walk on righteous judgment. Most people just judge out of opinion, suspicion, fault finding, and they call it discernment. Real discernment comes out of abounding love to where you don't just see the fault. You're willing to draw, draw the gold out of them. That's what's necessary. Do you want to draw the gold out? I like this... Uh, Stand as judges. I want people that can discern. I want people to make decisions based on hearing the voice of God, not on their opinion. And lastly, you know what he did with the sons of Zadok? He says, I am their inheritance. They don't get an inheritance. I'm their inheritance. Abraham said, God is my exceedingly great reward. That's a good thing. You people are guilty too over here. I preach to the left, so I just want to make sure these people don't feel neglected. <laughs> 42 years of preaching to my left. I'm not likely to change it soon. Just in case anybody over there thinks they're getting off the hook. <laughs> Fix your hope on the grace that will be revealed to you at the coming of the Lord Jesus. We can only yield to God's holiness. You can't get, attain holiness. But every... Significant move of God has been preceded by repentance. This is not a time to be an expert. This is a time to humble yourself and make yourself available for the grace. I like this, 1 Peter 1.13. You ought to write that down. This is a good one. This is the one the Lord used with me. Rest your hope. Hope for spiritual practicality. Hope for me is open. My heart's open to God. Rest your hope fully upon the grace to be revealed at the revelation of Jesus. I just stay open till he reveals himself. And I rest in that hope. Hope and open are synonymous. Somebody prays for me, physical healing, lay hands on me. I stay open whether anything happens right away or not. I don't, I don't, I don't shut the door, close off God. Rest your hope fully on the grace that will be revealed. Because grace will come to who? A humble? No. I like this. Jennifer and I have been studying because since this last experience that we've had, looking up at a lot of people's theology, because I'm, I'm having more experience than I've got theology for, so I'm probably in flux. But we've been looking at some of Wesley's writings, John Wesley. And it's interest that there's a goal. How many people have ever been confused by that word perfect in the Bible? Perfect. Some would say mature. But you know, John Wesley was crucified for saying exactly what it meant. Of course, they said he meant something else. All right, that's, that's the way it is. That's, that's the way church is, sorry. Everybody gets picked on. But perfect in the New Testament does not mean Perfect, he meant perfect love. He meant perfect unto its true end, to love God and love people. You've reached your purpose or maximum, you're reaching a maximum potential in God. How else could you say perfect? Uh, Loving God and loving one another. Isn't that what the command is? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He wants you to have the same heart. Isn't that the end of the charge to love? 
to fulfill the great commandment by loving God and man perfectly, a heart filled with love toward God and other people. We love with God's love by His grace. I can see why you got in trouble, though. Everybody go, oh, you can't do that. Whenever you think you can't do that, you're relying on you rather than the grace of God to bring you to that place. Any message that sounds too hard, you go, oh, I can't do that. Good, because apart from Him, you can do nothing. I'm torn between two statements. One was people, I always have compassion for people go, I'm a failure. And I'm going, no, you're not a failure. Fail, but don't be a failure. But then there's some of them, I want to just say, you are a failure. You can't do nothing apart from God. And sometimes it takes wisdom to know which is which. Right? That could be any of us, right? All right, you are a failure. Now, trust God because he's totally totally fulfills everything and your inheritance is in him God's going to raise up a people that are going to minister to God they're going to offer the fat and the blood they're not going to do it with sweat they're going to teach people God's people the difference between the holy and the unholy I want to see people restored. If you're watching by Ustream and you don't go to church anymore, you need to get back to some church. I don't know what church. But before you even get back to that church, do the 60-day challenge online if you're afraid of church people, which is foolishness. Do the 60-day challenge and work on this with you and God. And then go do something. Help somebody. Do something. Don't just sit back and, oh, let me tell you, I used to have, I had four worship teams in my first church, and it was so funny to watch how people picked on each other. Like, now with four worship teams, I had four different leaders, and Sister Sally didn't like this particular leader. So she would say, I'm sitting back, I just don't feel qualified to go up there, that phony religious stuff. I don't feel qualified when she really didn't like the leader. She wanted to be over here in this group. And I knew that. And they didn't, weren't resolving their problems. So I resolved. I said, God, what do I do? He said, you tell her to sit down and stay down until you tell her to go up. Oh, then she resolved her differences with the other worship leader real quick. People, I'm telling you. How many of us know that manipulation is sin? Yeah. Right? Playing those kind of games. Say, I'm 70 now. I'm going to tell you all the little tricks that I learned that normally I keep to myself. I know those games. I've seen it all. And I hope there's not too much more new <laughs> that I haven't seen. There's no new sin. They changed the name over the years. But it's the same old, same old. Hmm? How many want to consecrate to God and to walk what I'm doing, what Jennifer's doing? I want to, I've done this from the time I was a baby Christian. Any aspect of his character and his nature you can find in the Bible, like Jesus, my shepherd, Jehovah, Nisi, my provider. I wanted to spend a period of time, and there was no set time, but I would spend a time in everyday life walking in that relationship. We walked into Publix yesterday, Jennifer and I, and right before we went in, I said, I want to know him as the God who is holy. I am holy. Be thou holy. And he lives on the inside of me. I surrender to his holiness. We walked into Publix, and that's all. I was just enjoying surrendering to his holiness and yielding to him. I want to know him. I want to progressively become more intimately acquainted with all the wonders of his personhood, all aspects of his divine nature. And I'm walking, and Jennifer and I are walking, and a lady ran out from behind the delicatessen and came up and just grabbed both of our hands. Right before I walked in, I said, I want God, if, if this is the path that you're speaking to Jennifer and I, give me some kind of confirmation because I'm staying here. I'm staying here with wanting to develop you as a holiness. Give me a sign that someone recognizes something. Total stranger. Walked in and no sooner, it was three minutes, getting from the car into Publix, to where that woman came out from behind. She didn't know us. And she said, I saw the two of you coming in and I just had to come and hold our hands. 
I want to see that happen for everybody. But you walk in relationship with him. I am holy. I, Jehovah, your Elohim, am holy. Be holy, for I am holy. I can't do that, but I can certainly surrender to the Holy One in me, can I? And I can practice that. And you know what I find out? As you practice that, the seas of the flesh, I mean, know oh, the six deadly seas. All of a sudden, you're not coveting. You quit, you people are guilty too. Uh, comparing, <laughs> coveting, comparing, competing, concealing, criticizing, complaining, criticizing, complaining, and controlling. You yield and surrender to Him. You pledge your allegiance to yielding and surrendering to Him. Those things fall off without you trying. And all of a sudden you realize that you've got victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. Think about it. The world, the flesh, and the devil. That's the next message. I can't, I'm going to keep you too long. I want to pray for everybody for reconsecration. I just feel like God's got an anointing on me and I want to pray. I don't know what you can, you can't impart holiness. But I can impart to you whatever love I've got and give it away and pour it out and hope that you consecrate yourself more fully and completely. Now remember, if you're going through a bad time, you don't just do the internal. After the internal, say, what can I do toward other people? How can I be a blessing to other people? Because everyone that I saw got restored. Everyone I saw who didn't get restored quit at the doing. And they just stayed in isolation working on the inside. That doesn't work. That's good for two or three months. After that, be part of somebody. Just like my spiritual father put that person who fell into homosexuality, he put him in the choir because he said, you know what, Dennis? He said, when I talk to him privately, the only times he really feels the presence of God is when he worships. So he said, I put him up there. I'm sure there's a lot of religious people that say, no, that's not, well, okay, you have a better plan. I've seen it work. I've seen it work. You have a better plan? Show me because I haven't seen it in the church. They usually shoot the wounded. I'm saying there's, there's going to be a harvest that's coming and these people are going to be as messed up as you've ever seen people messed up. Somebody better help them. And you need to receive the comfort from the Holy Spirit and then comfort them with the same comfort. They're going to be coming in. We've got mothers calling us with little children Little toddlers coming home from school go, Mommy, am I a boy or am I a girl? My heart breaks for them people. By golly, we've got to get a church with some answers and quit watering down the gospel just to make everybody happy. We are the opposite of seeker-friendly. We're not even friendly sometimes. We're going to tell you the truth. <laughs> I want to be like Jesus. Unless you drink my blood and eat my flesh. Whoa, that'll keep the numbers down. Right? <laughs> but don't you think it's about time we had that, though? Because I can give you a feel-good message. That's easy. That's easy to do, but I'll tell you what. If you don't get the truth pretty soon, you're not going to be of much value to anybody else that's hurting. At some point, you're going to have to be the hospital to heal the wounded body of Christ. And the next message will give you the how-tos. But for today, I want to pray. I want to lay hands. Let's start with this section. No, actually, let's start with this section over here. This, they're neglected. Come on up. I just want to lay hands quickly and go back to your seat. I just want to believe for an impartation that whatever God is doing, by golly, I'm going to get some. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. T 
Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-Day Challenge, Self-Deliverance, Healing Rejection, Codependency, Intimate Prayer, The Functions of the Human Spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you can take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.